it's easier to preach after somebody has sung everybody happy. And I'm not going to sing to you today because I'm not my father. Some of y'all might have known my dad, Herbert Campbell. He was a singer. That man could sing me happy while he was whooping me. I'm not him. I will declare God's word to you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will lift your spirits. But if I try to sing to you, you would not be happy today, Sam. Trust me on this one, amen? But I do want to talk to you today about a promise. Some of you all have heard at various parts of this worship service the theme of God's promise. If you are confessional and evangelical, you know that your life, your, your spiritual life is interwoven with the thoughts of God's promise. Now, some of God's promises are worthy of treasuring and clinging to and gazing upon because they are promises for good. Some of God's promises are promises that you would do well to keep far from you because they are promises of his righteous judgment. But today, I'd like to share with you a promise of peace, amen? Normally, when I speak to the folk at St. John, I like to tell them a little story, so don't worry, it won't be long. I think you'll like it. An elderly Christian man was in much distress as he lay dying. Oh, pastor, he said, for years I have relied upon the promises of God, and now in this hour of death, I can't remember a single one of them to comfort me. Knowing that Satan was disturbing him, the pastor said to him, my brother, do you think that God will forget any of his promises? The smile came across the face of the man as he said, no, no, he won't. Praise the Lord. Now I can fall asleep in Jesus and trust him to remember them all and bring me safely to heaven. Peace flooded his soul. And a short time later, he was ushered by the angels into the light of God's eternal day. Bow your heads with me in prayer. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You know, saints, friends, family, we now live in a cultural climate where Christianity is often viewed with the same sort of indifference that we've held for the worship of Zeus or belief in Santa Claus. It's looked at perhaps used as a plot device in movies or television shows, but it's not really taken seriously by those who view faith in Christ as a crutch. You know, some of y'all have probably heard those words from a friend, a colleague, a coworker. They'll tell you, oh, you know, people that believe in Jesus, that's just something for the weak of mind. Sometimes they'll respond to the gospel message with questions like, why should we care about a message that is intended to address problems that we no longer view as relevant? Who believes in a universe where God and heaven are physically located above us? Hell is somewhere below us. And Jesus flew out into space to meet with his father in the air. But for still others, a dismissive whatever puts the whole matter to bed at least until someone's death interrupts their busy lives. Now I know we're sitting here in St. John's sanctuary and so no one's going to destroy the mood. That would be rude, right? 
But as church growth marketer, Richard Chancey wrote me in a recent email, according to a recent article from Pathios 2006, represents what might be the high point of Christian dominance in America. Since then, the rate of church closures has exceeded the number of new church plants, which means that the church as we know it is no longer capable of keeping pace with population increase. St. John's is getting ready to celebrate 150 years of active ministry in the Calumet region. As the oldest congregation north of the Calumet River, those of you that entered through those doors today might have seen the sign that states, St. John's Church, the oldest surviving institution in Gary, north of the Little Calumet, began with the work of the Reverend Henry Funter in the 1860s. Baptism records date from 1863. The first church was built on this site in 1868 or 1869. In 1870, it celebrated as the date of organization. Well, on December 8th, 1991, Larry Chandler entered the church records as an adult confirmand. His confirmation verse was Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. His wife Mary and their family worshiped the Lord, supported this ministry, and walked in fellowship with other believers. Mary's life was celebrated last year, June 4th, 2018. And today, April 12th, 2019, we acknowledge the grace of God in the life of her husband, Larry. And for a few minutes, I'd like to share with you the significance of this passage that he chose as his confirmation verse. This passage of scripture that the Holy Spirit used to bring comfort and peace to his child, Larry. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul describes our spiritual condition as children of Abraham who, by his transgression, in the Garden of Eden, brought death to himself and to the human family. Indeed, to the entire creation, as Paul wrote the church in Rome, Romans 5, 12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, rather than leaving us to our condemnation, though God provided the way of escape through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10, you heard it earlier in the gospel reading. But let me read those, those verses that he come to. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not a result of works. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. The Greek word literally means poem. His piece of artistry. His beautiful creation created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand for you to walk in them. It's not because of your good works, your wealth, or your lineage, but because of his great love, amen, God looked upon you in mercy. Verses one through three describe our position apart from Christ. And you were dead in trespasses and in the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the flesh and of the mind and the body, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. And don't let this beautiful stole and this white robe fool you. That condemnation includes me, includes everyone that walks through those doors today, everyone that came through here last Sunday, those that sang the hymns of the church, those that placed an offering in the altering plate, 
those that didn't either, those that walked by the door and kept going, every last one of us stands equally condemned under this same sentence of death, but everybody sitting here is equally eligible for the free offer of forgiveness that came as a result of Christ's holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death on the cross. People ask why Lutherans focus so much on Christ on the cross, while other churches go so far as to remove all images of either cross or crucifix from their sanctuaries, their marquees, and even their identities. Some of you may have visited a church, beautiful interior, Wonderful sound system, screens, carpet, comfortable chairs, and not a single cross. They will provide for you all kinds of oh, games and activities and recreation and, and assistance, but no cross. They, they will be active in the community, politically, in business, all manner of things, but no cross. And the problem with not having a cross is, is that without a cross, we have no way of determining just where our hope lies. Without a cross, life and death are, are just things that happen. Without a cross, Jesus is just a name in history, maybe a myth, maybe a nice guy. We don't know. No one's ever said a bad thing about him. But without a cross, church is just another place where people hang out on Sunday before they go to the buffet afterward. Now, the historic Christian church has always said about this, that, that our life is bound up in Christ's death, even as we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death until he comes, amen? But how, how, <laughs> given the universal acknowledgement again of the goodness of Jesus, how does that help you or me? If our sins condemn each one of us and there's nobody that doesn't sin, well, isn't the only escape simply to deny the reality of sin, condemnation and eternal damnation? Isn't it better just to say that I'm okay and you're okay and if you just don't think about it, everything will be okay? No, no, there's a better way, saints. There is a much, there is a more excellent way. Romans 6, 3 and 4, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And we were buried with him in baptism so that as Christ was raised from the dead, even so, you can walk in newness of life. That same Jesus, whom we will celebrate next week, as coming into Jerusalem, riding on a coat, that same Jesus, who by that Friday was condemned to die on a cross, that same Jesus, who three days later rose again, that same Jesus who 40 days later returned to his father, declaring that all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That same Jesus who declared over broken bread, this is my body given for you. And over the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. He also declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's the hope, that's the promise that Mary and Larry and their children were taught. That's the hope, that's the promise that they were committed to in holy baptism that was sealed in confirmation and carried them through life. That's the hope that brought me 
back from California to stand in this desk where 11 men before me preached that same gospel. And because of the word of Christ, because of his promises, we don't sorrow in the face of death of loved ones as those who have no hope. We confess that we do mourn our loss. But those who die in the Lord, according to the scriptures, have a share in the resurrection of Christ. The confidence in the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ has sustained this congregation for 150 years. It sustained many of you to this day, to this hour. It sustained us through 12 pastors, through changes in language, ethnicity, and population, through times of great activity and times of seeming stagnation. And today, we acknowledge Larry. Larry is a brother in Christ. Larry is a friend and supporter of St. John's. Larry as a fellow worker in this vineyard. And Larry as another who has joined that great cloud of witnesses. Amen. Jesus gave us another promise contained in 1 Thessalonians 4. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and with the voice of an archangel. And those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. I pray that that's your hope today. I pray that you know that as your exceeding great as precious promise because for those who reject the gift of salvation in Christ, there is another promise. Jude 14 and 15, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all, to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodly that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There is a joy. There is a freedom, a peace that belongs to those who trust in Christ. It's a gift, a gift of grace, and that means there's nothing that you can do whatsoever in any way to earn it. It can be resisted though, and, and many do, because they can't see. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. You might not see it today, whether through your sorrow or because of the deceitfulness of sin. But God has promised a glorious future. I say that again, a glorious future without sin, without sorrow, without suffering. Wouldn't you like that? He's promised it. The God who cannot lie, the God who is faithful has promised this to those who believe the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And we believe, teach, and confess that there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, 
And if you've been united with Christ through holy baptism, remember your baptism now and rejoice because he is gracious and abundant in mercy. Now, if you woke up today alienated from the life of God and seeing him as your enemy, instead of knowing him as our father who art in heaven, repent and believe that Christ died. Yes, he died for you and you and you. He died for you and he rose again from the dead for you. Believe the gospel today and be saved. Let today be the start of a beautiful relationship or the renewal of one that you thought you could never get back. Then today won't be the day that you said goodbye to Dad Larry. It'll be the day that you said, God be with you until we meet again. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.